So, are you ready for your next instalment of Skellig? Chapter 25. The wires in the tubes were in her again. The glass case was shut. She didn't move. She was wrapped in white. Her hair was fluffy, dead straight and dark. I wanted to touch it and to touch her skin, feel it soft against my fingertips. Her little hands were clenched tight on either side of her head. We said nothing. I listened to the drone of the city outside, to the clatter of the hospital. I heard my own breathing, the scared, quick breathing of my parents at my side. I heard them sniffing back their tears. I went on listening. I listened through all these noises until I heard the baby, the gentle squeaking of her breath, tiny and distant, as if it came from a different world. I closed my eyes and went on listening and listening. I listened deeper until I believed I heard her beating heart. I told myself that if I listened hard enough, her breathing and the beating of her heart would never be able to stop. Dad held my hand as we walked through the corridors towards the car park. We passed a lift shaft and the woman with the Zimmer frame from upstairs tottered out. She gasped and rested on her frame and grinned at me. Three times round every landing and three times up and down in the lift, she said. Knackered, absolutely knackered. Dad blinked and nodded kindly at her. Blinking, get in there, she said. She bobbed about inside the frame. Be dancing soon, you see. She patted my arm with her crooked hand. You're so sad today. Been to see that friend of yours? I nodded and she smiled. I'm going home soon. He will too. Keep moving, that's the thing. Stay cheerful. She hobbled away, singing Lord of the Dance to herself. Who did she mean, your friend, said Dad. Nobody. He was too distracted to ask again. In the car, I saw the tears running down his face. I closed my eyes. I remembered the sound of the baby's breathing, her beating heart. I held them in my mind, went on listening to them. I touched my heart and I felt the baby's heart beating beside my own. Traffic roared past. Dad sniffed back his tears. I stayed dead silent, concentrated on keeping the baby safe. Chapter 26 There it is, said Mina. Archaeopteryx, the dinosaur that flew. She laid the heavy encyclopedia on the grass beneath the tree. We looked down at the clumsy creature. It was perched on a thorny branch. Beyond it, volcanoes belched flames and smoke. The great land-bound creatures, Diplodocus, Stegosaurus, lurched across a stony plain. We believe that dinosaurs became extinct, said Mina. But there's another theory, that their descendants are with us still. They nest in our trees and our attics. The air is filled with their songs. The little Archaeopteryx survived and began the line of evolution that led to birds. She touched the short, stunted wings. Wings and feathers, see. But the creature was a heavy, bony thing. Look at the clumsy, leaden tail. It was capable of nothing but short, sudden flights. From tree to tree, stone to stone. It couldn't rise and spiral and dance like birds can now. No pneumatisation. I looked at her. Do you remember nothing, she said. Pneumatisation. The presence of air cavities in the bones of birds. It's this which allows them free flight. The blackbird flew from the tree above us and dashed into the sky. If you held the Archaeopteryx, she said, it would be almost as heavy as a stone in your hand. It would be almost as heavy as the clay models I make. I looked into Mina's dark eyes. They were wide open, expectant, like she wanted me to see something or say something. I thought of the baby in my lap, of Skellig slung between Mina and me. I thought of his wings and of the baby's fluttering heart. There's no end to evolution, said Mina. She shuffled closer to me. We have to be ready to move forward, she said. Maybe this is not how we are meant to be forever. She took my hand. We are extraordinary, she whispered. She looked deep into me. Skellig, she whispered. Skellig, Skellig. I stared back. 
I didn't blink. It was like she was calling Skellig out from somewhere deep inside me. It was like we were looking into the place where each other's dreams came from. And then there was a sniggering and giggling. We looked up and there were Leaky and Coot standing on the other side of the wall, looking down at us. Chapter 27 What's wrong with you? they kept asking. What's blooming wrong with you? I was hopeless. I couldn't tackle. I missed the ball by a mile when I jumped up to head it. When I had the ball at my feet, I stumbled all over the place. I fell over it once and skinned my elbow on the curb. I felt shaky and wobbly and I didn't want to be doing this, playing football in our front street with Leaky and Coop while Mina sat in the tree with a book in her lap and stared and stared. It's because he's been ill, said Leaky. Rubbish, said Coot. He's not been ill. He's just been upset. He watched me trying to flick the ball up onto my head. It bounced off my knee and bobbed into the gutter. I'm just out of practice, I said. Rubbish, he said. It's just been a week since you could beat anybody in the school. That's right, said Leaky. It's her, said Coot. Her in the tree. The lassie was with. Leaky grinned. That's right, he said. I shook my head. Rubbish, I whispered. My voice was shaky as my feet had been. They stood there sniggering. It's that lass, said Leaky. That lass that climbs in a tree like a monkey, said Coot. Her that sits in a tree like a crow. Rubbish, I said. I looked Leaky in the eye. He'd been my best friend for years. I couldn't believe he'd go on with this if I looked him in the eye and wanted him to stop. He grinned. He holds hands with her, he said. She says he's extraordinary, said Coot. I'll get stuffed, I said. I turned away from them, went past our house to the end of the street, turned down towards the back lane. I heard them coming after me. I sat down in the lane with my back against the boarded up garage. I just wanted them to go away. I wanted them to stay. I wanted to be able to, to, be able to play like I used to wanted things to be just the way they used to be. Leaky crouched beside me and I could feel he was sorry. The baby's ill, I said, really ill. The doctor says I'm in distress. Yeah, he said, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. Coop kicked the ball back and forwards against the boards. Don't do that, I said, you'll knock it down. He sniggered, oh I? He went on doing it. Don't do it, I said. I got up and grabbed him by the scruff of the neck. Stop doing it, I said. He sniggered again. Doing what, Michael? He said in a high girlish voice. I shoved him back against the garage. I thumped my hand against the boards beside his head. He winked at Leaky. See what I mean, he said. I thumped the boards beside his head again. There was a loud crack and the whole garage trembled. Coop jumped away. We stared at the boards. Blummin' heck, said Leaky. There was another crack and another shudder. And then, silence. I opened the gate into the wilderness and we tiptoed inside. We stared through the door into the gloomy garage. Dusk was falling thicker than ever through the light. There was another crack. Blummin' heck, said Coot. I'd better get my dad, I said. Chapter 28 Very gently, using a little hammer and long, thin nails, he nailed some boards across the door. The garage trembled as he worked. He told us to keep back. We stood in the wilderness, staring, shaking our heads. He got some black gloss paint and wrote DANGER across the boards. He brought some coke for us and some beer for himself and we all sat against the house wall and stared at the garage. Better get it made safe, eh, said Dad. My uncle's a builder, said Coot, always doing garages and extensions and things. Aye, said Dad. He'd tell you, knock the whole thing down and start again. Aye? Aye, some folk fight to keep things that should have been smashed years back. I looked at the garage and imagined it gone. Saw the big emptiness that would take its place. I said Coot again. He says the best jobs start with a massive sledgehammer and a massive skip. He swigged his coke. The blackbird flew onto the edge of the garage roof and perched there. 
I knew it would be watching the wilderness, looking for beetles and fat worms for its babies. He wants us gone, I said. Coop cocked his finger and thumb like a gun. He eyed the bird as if he was aiming. Gotcha, he said, and his hand recoiled as if he'd fired. Dad told Leaky and Coot it was good to see them again. Michael's been moping, he said. A good kick about with his mates will be just what the doctor ordered. Not against the garage, though, said Leaky. Not against a blinking garage, no. We took them all and went through the house into the front street again. Mina wasn't there. I played better now, but I couldn't help turning to the empty tree. I imagined her alone with Skellig in the dark house. I caught them laughing at me. Missing her already, said Coot. I raised my eyes and tried to grin. I went to sit on our front garden wall. Who is she anyway, said Leaky. I shrugged. She's called Mina. What school is she at? She doesn't go to school. They looked at me. How's that, said Leaky. Place the wag, said Coot. Her mother teaches her, I said. They looked again. Blooming heck, said Leaky. I thought you had to go to school. Imagine it, said Coot. They imagined it for a while. Lucky son, said Leaky. What will she do for mates, though, said Coot. And who'd like to be stuck at home all day? They think schools stop you from learning, I said. They think schools try to make everybody just the same. That's rubbish, said Coot. I said, Leaky, you're learning all day long in school. I shrugged. Maybe. Is that why you've not been coming in, said Leaky? Is it because you've never come in back again? Are you going to let that lassie's mother teach you? Of course not, I said. But they're going to teach me some things. Like? Like modelling with clay. And about William Blake. Who's he, said Coot, that bloke that's got the butcher's shop in town. He said, school drives all joy away, I said. He was a painter and a poet. They looked at each other and grinned. Leaky couldn't look me in the eye. I could feel my face burning and burning. Look, I said, I can't tell you anything, but the world's full of amazing things. Coot sighed and shook his head and bounced the ball between his knees. I've seen them, I said. Leaky just stared at me. I imagined taking him through the danger door, taking him to Skelly, showing him. For a moment, I was dying to tell him what I'd seen and what I'd touched. There she is, said Coot. We turned together and there was Mina climbing into the tree again. The monkey girl, said Leaky. Coot giggled. Hey, he said, maybe Rasputin's right about that evolution stuff. He could come and look at her and see there's monkeys all around us still. And that's it for today. See you next time.